All right, let's get started. So we're gonna continue talking about Bayesian networks, which we started on Monday. Um, and just a kind of quick recap, uh, we've been talking about Bayesian networks, which is a, a new paradigm for defining models. Um, and what is a Bayesian network? Uh, you have a set of variables, which are nodes in a graph. For example, uh, whether you have a cold, whether you have allergies, whether you're coughing, whether you have itchy eyes. These nodes are related by a set of directed edges, which capture various dependencies. For example, itchy eyes is caused by allergies, but not cold or by cough. And then formally, for every variable in the Bayesian network, you have a local conditional distribution, which specifies the distribution over that variable given the parents. So the parents of cough are cold and allergies, so you would have a local conditional distribution of P of H given CNA. You do that for all of the variables. And finally, you take all of the factors or local conditional distributions and you multiply them together and you get one glorious uh, joint distribution over all the possible variables in your uh, distribution, okay? So in other words, to sum it up, you can think about Bayesian networks as factor crafts plus probability. They allow you to define ginormous joint distributions over lots of random variables uh, using factor graphs, which allow you to specify things very compactly. And moreover, we saw um, glimpses of how we can use the structure of factor graphs to uh, permit efficient inference. So probabilistic inference in Bayesian networks is the task of Given a Bayesian network, which is you know, this oracle about uh, the, what you know about uh, the world, um, and you look at some evidence that you found. So it's, you know, it's raining or not raining, or, <coughs> or you have itchy eyes or so on. And you condition on that evidence, and you also have a set of query variables that you're interested in asking about. And the goal is to compute the probability of the query variable is conditioned on the evidence that you see. Big E equals little e. Remember, large, uppercase is random variables, lowercase is, um, is actual values. Um, and so for example, um, in the coughing case, there's um, the probability of a cold uh, given the fact that you're coughing but don't have itchy eyes. And this, prob this probability is defined by just the laws of probability, which we went over uh, the first uh, slide of last lecture. Um, and the challenge is how to do this efficiently. Okay, and that's gonna be the topic of uh, this, this class. So any questions about the basic setup of what Bayesian networks are and um, how do you, what does it mean to do probabilistic inference? Okay, one maybe kind of a high level note about Bayesian networks is that I, I think they're really um, powerful as a way to describe kind of knowledge. I think a lot of uh, AI today is focused on particular tasks where you define some output, inputs and you define some outputs and you train a classifier. And the classifier that you train can only do this one thing, input to output. But the paradigm behind Bayesian networks and you know, databases in general is that you have developed a kind of a knowledge uh, source which can be probabilistic. It's captured by this joint distribution. And once you have it, you use the tools of probability to allow you answer arbitrary questions about it. So you can give me any pieces of evidence and any query and it's clear what I'm meant to do. I'm supposed to com compute these values. So this, it's kind of a more flexible and powerful uh, paradigm than just you know, converting inputs to outputs. And so that's why I think it's so interesting. Okay, so uh, today we're gonna focus on how to compute these arbitrary inference queries uh, efficiently. Um, I'm gonna start with forward, backward, and particle filtering. These are going to specialize to the specific uh, Bayesian networks uh, called HMMs, uh, hidden Markov models. And then we're gonna look at Gibbs sampling, which is a much uh, you know, more general way of doing things. Okay, so... Um, a hidden Markov model, which I talked about uh, last time, um, which we're going to go in more detail this time, is uh, a Bayesian network where there exists uh, a sequence of 
hidden variables and a corresponding sequence of observed variables. So as a kind of motivating example, imagine you're tracking some sort of object. Um, in your homework, you'll be tracking cars. So uh, hi is going to be the location of the object or car at a particular time step i. And ei is going to be some sort of sensor reading that you get at that particular time step. It could be the location plus some noise or some sort of distance to that, um, the true object, um, and so on. Okay, so these are the variables. And uh, you know, it goes without saying that the, the hidden variables are hidden and the observed variables are observed. Um, so the distributions over uh, this, all the variables is specified by three types of local conditional distributions. The first one is just the starting distribution. What is the probability of H1? Um, this could be a uniform over all possible locations, just as an example. Um, and then we have the transition distributions, which specify what is the distribution over a particular hidden variable, the location of the true location of object, HI, given HI minus one. So this captures dynamics of how this object or car might move over time. Um, for example, it could just be a uniform over adjacent locations, right? So cars can't teleport. They can only move to adjacent locations over a, a one time step. And finally, we have emission distributions, which uh, govern how the sensor reading is uh, computed as a function of the location, okay? Um, so this, again, could be something as simple as uniform over adjacent locations um, if you expect to see some noise in your sensor. The sensor doesn't tell you where exactly the car is, but tells you approximately where the car is. And the joint distribution over all these random variables is going to be given by simply the product of everything you see on the board. I'm just gonna write this up on the board just for you know, reference. Um, so we have the probability of H equals H, so this, when I write H equals H, that means uh, the H1 through HN. So all the random variables, uh, all the hidden random variables, all the observed random variables, and this is by definition equal to um, the, the start distribution. Um, let's see, just make sure I have, okay, good notation here. So start distribution over um, H1, and then I have the transitions, i equals um, one, to, uh, or I guess two to n, just to make sure, okay. So this is the probability of um, hi given hi minus one. And then finally I have for every time step i through one through n, I have the probability of an observation given um, hi. Okay. So multiply all these factors together, that gives me a single number that is uh, the probability of all the observed and all the hidden variables. Okay. Any questions about the definition of a hidden Markov model? Okay, so given we have one of these models, remember with a Bayesian network I can answer any sort of queries. I can ask what is the probability of um, H3 given H2 and E5? And I can do, do all sorts of crazy things. And all of these things are possible and efficient to um, you know, compute, but we're gonna focus on two main types of questions, um, motivated by the, uh, let's say, object tracking example. The first question is filtering. Filtering says, you're at a particular time step, let's say time step three. What, what do I know about the true object location, H3, given all the evidence I've seen up until uh, now? So this is kind of real-time object tracking. At each point in time, you look at all the evidence and you want to know where um, the object is. Uh, a similar question is smoothing, and you're still looking at a particular time step, um, um, three, let's say, um, but you're conditioning on all the evidence. So you're looking at all the observations and you're looking at, you're kind of thinking about uh, this more uh, retrospectively. Where was object, where was the object at time step three? So think about if you're trying to reconstruct the trajectory or something. Okay, so this is called filtering and smoothing. Um, so let's now 
tried to develop um, an algorithm for answering these type of queries. And um, without loss of generality, I'm going to focus on answering smoothing queries. Um, so my, why is it the case that if I tell you I can solve all smoothing uh, questions, I can also solve all filtering questions? Uh, so it is true. So that this um, in filtering, this is a, the evidence is a subset, um, but the answers are going to be different depending on what evidence you compute on. So you can't literally just use one as the answer for the other. Yeah. Relies over the things that you uh, like E four and E five to get to the filter. Yeah, system. yeah. So you marginalize. That's a that's a key idea. Is that suppose I had a smoother and I wanted to answer this filtering query. Right, so this is H3 given E1 to E2 to E3. Right, remember last time we talked about how if you can take leaves of Bayesian networks which are not observed and just essentially wipe them away. So if you don't observe E4, E5, H4, H5, you can just pretend those things you know, don't exist. Right. And now you're back to a smoothing query where you're conditioning on all the evidence. Okay, so we're gonna focus on smoothing. Um, and to make a progress on this problem, I'm going to introduce a representation that's going to help us th think about um, the possible assignments, right? And, and just to be, be clear, right, there's, the reason why this is not completely trivial is that there are, for, if you have n um, hidden variables, there's two to the n or exponential in n number of possible assignments. And you can't just enumerate all of them. So you're going to have to come up with some algorithm that can compute it more efficiently. Okay, so what we're going to do is introduce this lattice representation, which is going to give us a compact way of representing those assignments. Um, and then we can see how we can operate on that representation. Okay, so this is going to smell a lot like state-based models. So we're kind of going backwards, um, but uh, hopefully it'll make sense. So the idea behind a lattice representation is that I'm going to have... Um, uh, a set of rows and columns. So each column is going to correspond to a particular uh, variable. So the first column is going to correspond to H1, and each row is going to correspond to some setting of uh, that variable. So there's two possible things I can do. I can either uh, set H1 equals 1, or I can set H1 equals 2. I'm s the version I'm drawing on the board is going to be a simplification of what I have on the slides just uh, in the interest of space. Um, and the second column is going to be either um, H2 equals one or H2 equals two. So by going through these uh, lattice nodes, which are drawn as boxes, I'm kind of assigning random variables to a particular value. Okay, so I'm gonna connect these up. So from this state, I can either set H2 equals one or two. Here I can also go from to one or two. And finally, let's just do h3 equals 1, h3 equals 2. And similarly, I can choose either one of them from no matter where I am. And finally, I have an end state. Okay. So first, notice that the size of the lattice is reasonably well controlled. It's simply the number of time steps times the number of values that um, a variable can take on. So um, let's suppose that there's n time steps. and um, k uh, possible, let's say, locations, so values of hi. So how many uh, nodes are here? K times n, right? Okay, so that means we can essentially, uh, this doesn't blow up exponentially. Okay, so now um, let us interpret a path from start to end. What does a path from start to end tell us? So let's take, let's take this path. You know, what, is, what does this tell us? Yeah. It's like a particular assignment of a random variable. Yeah, it's a particular assignment of the variable. So this one says set h1 to 1, h2 to 1, h3 to 1. This path says set h1 to 2, h1 to 1, and h3 to 2, and so on. Okay? So every path from start to end is an assignment to all the 
uh, unobserved or hidden variables. Okay, so now remember each assignment comes with some sort of probability. So we're gonna try to represent those probabilities um, juxtaposed on this graph. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go through each of the, these edges. So remember, these are the probabilities, right? So every assignment has, is a product of the factors, and I'm going to basically take these factors and just sprinkle them on the edges um, at the points where I can compute the factors. And I'll uh, explain more what I mean by this, okay? Um, so, so maybe one, one kind of preliminary thing I should um, mention is, um, suppose for this example, we have, um, we are conditioning on E1 equals one, um, E2 equals um, uh, two, let's say E1 equals, uh, sorry, E3 equals one, okay? So I'm conditioning on these uh, things. Um, notice I'm not drawing them in here because these are observed variables. I don't have to reason about what values they take on. I'm only gonna consider the hidden variables which I don't know. But this is just gonna be some sort of reference. Okay, so let's start with um, start to H1 equals one, right? So if you remember uh, backtracking and CSPs, right, we basically took uh, factors and then whenever we could evaluate the factor, we just put it down on that um, you know, edge in the uh, backtracking tree. So here, what can we do? We have the probability of um, H1 equals one. Okay, and then we also have the probability of the, the first emission probability I can compute, right? So that's a probability of E1 equals the evidence I saw, which is one, given H1 equals one, which is the value that I've committed to here. So this is a number that um, is essentially the weight or cost or, or score or whatever you wanna call it that I um, am going to incur when I traverse that edge. Okay, so what about this one? So I have the transition from uh, P, let's say uh, H2 equals one given H1 equals one and times the probability of E2 equals whatever I observe, which is two given H2 equals one. And similarly over here, I have probability of H3 equals one given H2 equals one times the probability of E3 equals one, which is what I observe, given H3 equals one. And then over here, there's no more factors uh, left, so I'm just gonna put one there. Okay, so, and you can check that when I traverse this path and I multiply all of these uh, probabilities together, that's exactly this expression for uh, H1 equals one, H2 equals one, H3 equals one, um, E1 equals one, E2 equals two, E3 equals one. And for each of these edges, I have an analogous quantity depending on the values that I'm dealing with. Okay, any questions about this uh, basic idea? So in the slides, um, this is basically uh, what I just said. Okay, so, so now, um, now what I'm trying to do now is to, let's say I'm interested in um, you know, smoothing. So I'm interested in what is the probability of H3 equals two, right? Actually, let's, let's do the example on the board just, uh, just to, um, because that's one I'll actually do. So suppose I'm interested in probability of H2 equals, uh, let's say two, given the evidence, E2 equals two, E3 equals one. Okay, so this is the, the query I'm kind of interested in you know, computing, okay? So how can I interpret this um, quantity in terms of this uh, lattice, right? So this is, there is this um, H2 equals two here, right? That's somehow privileged. And I'm asking, you know, what is the probability of this given the evidence. Yeah. Some of all of the probabilities in the concept, I don't think 
Yeah, so sum over all the um, probabilities of the paths, right? So remember, every path through, uh, from start to end is an assignment. Some of those paths go through this node, which means that H2 equals two, and some of them don't, which that means that it's not true, right? So if you look at all those paths and you uh, sum up their weights of this node, and divide by the sum over all paths, then you get the probability of H2 equals two given the evidence. Okay, so let me just write this. This is going to be uh, sum over, um, colloquially sum over paths through um, H2 equals two divided by sum over all paths. Okay, so now the problem is to compute the sum over all paths going through um, H2 or not going through H2. Okay, again, we don't want to sum over all the paths literally because that's going to be um, exponential time. So how can we do this? Yeah. Say sum, do you mean sum of the weights or sum of the counts? Like how many paths? Right. So what do I mean by sum? I mean sum of the weights. So every path has a weight, which is the product of the weights on the edges, and you sum over those weights. Okay, so what's an idea that we can use to compute the, the sum efficiently? Some keyword. Uh, dynamic programming? Yeah, dynamic programming. Okay, so this, um, we're gonna do this kind of recursively. Um, let me just show this slide. So. Um, it's going to be a little bit different from the diamond programming that we saw uh, before. It's going to be um, more general because we're not computing, let's say, uh, one particular query, but I'm going to compute a bunch of quantities that are going to allow us to compute all queries, essentially. Um, okay, so let's, there's going to be three quantities I'm going to look at, um, and hopefully I can kind of out of colors, but um, let's not use green for this then. So there is going to be, um, you know, forward messages, um, F, which I'll explain in a bit. There's going to be backward uh, messages, uh, B. Okay, so what I want to do is, uh, for every node, I'm gonna compute two numbers. Yeah, question? Um, no, I have, I think I'm, okay. What color is that? Um, sure, I'll take a blue marker. Yeah, great. Thanks. Okay, great. So, um, let's call this S, okay. Um, okay, so, um, so for every node, I'm gonna compute two numbers. One number we'll call the forward number is, or the forward message is going to be the sum over uh, the weights of the partial paths going into that node, and the orange number is going to be the sum of all the partial paths from that node to the end. Okay, so let's uh, let's um, so these are all meant to be probabilities, so the numbers should be less than one. But just to keep things simple, I'm going to put actual numbers on these just to. Um, uh, just to integers on them so they don't have to carry around decimal points. Okay, so this is one, let's say one, two, one, um, one, two, one, uh, one, two, and one. Okay, so remember every edge has a weight associated with it. And so now let me compute um, the forward probability. So what is the sum of all the paths going into that node? It's just one. Right? Okay, so, uh, sorry, forward is green. So one, and this is two, okay? Just copying this. And now recursively, what is the um, sum of all the weights going into this? Okay, so um, I could have come from here or I could have come from here. All right, so if I come from here, it's one times um, whatever the sum was there. So that's one times one, that's one. Um, plus two times two. Okay, so I'm gonna get a five, one plus four. And here I'm going to have 
uh, one times one, so that's one. One times two, that's two, so that's going to be uh, three. Hopefully you guys are checking my math here. Um, so what about this note? So now recursively, this could have, the paths going in here could have come from this node or that node. So that's two times five, so that's 10. One times three, and that's uh, three, so that's 13. And this is uh, one times five plus uh, three times two, so that's um, 11, right? Okay. So 13 represents the sum over all paths going into HC equals one, okay? So I can do the backward direction. So, um, so this is going to be uh, in orange, the backward messages which are um, paths going to the end. So this is gonna be one. So here I'm going to have, uh, so two times one plus one times one. So that's a three. Um, this is one times one, two times one. So that's a three as well. Uh, this is one times three, uh, one times three, so that's a six. This is two times, so that's a six and a three, so that's a nine, um, and then I'm you know, done, okay? Okay, does that all make sense? So these are kind of compact representations over the, essentially the flow in and out of uh, these uh, lattice nodes. Okay, so the, the kind of the, kind of magic happens um, when I have um, these S's, so now for every node, I'm going to also just multiply them together. Okay, so that's going to be a six, uh, 18, um, 18, uh, nine, 13, 11, and that's it, okay? So what happens when I multiply them together? Let's take a look at this node, right? So what does nine represent? Nine represents the sum over all the paths going through here, right? Because I can take whatever paths I have coming in, and I can take whatever paths I have going out, and any sort of combination of them will be a valid end-to-end -end path. Okay, and the, so this total weight is nine there. Yeah? Why instead of sum in, for this case? Uh, so why do we multiply instead of sum here? Um, because we're multiplying, the weight of a path is the product, okay? Mathematically, what's going on is um, exactly factoring, right? So uh, suppose I had um, numbers, let's say A, um, B, and C, and D, and I could choose A and B and C and D. So what are the possible, so then I can do A plus B times C plus D. Right, which is the sum over all possible paths, and uh, you can thus paths are either AC, uh, AD, BC, and BD. Okay, so I'm basically doing this, this uh, computing it in a factorized way rather than expanding out. That's mathematically what's going on when I multiply the forward and the backward messages. And why are these called messages? So the idea of messages uh, comes from the fact that you can intuitively think about the forward messages as being kind of sent across the graph, right? Because the message here depends only on the neighbors here. And once I get these messages, I can compute the f my messages the next time step based on this. So it's kind of a summary of what's going on, and I, I send the messages forward, and same in the backward direction. Okay, so now once I have these values, um, how do I go in back and compute my query? Sum over a path through h2 equals two. What is that? Nine, right? And over the sum over all paths, what's the sum over all paths? Sorry, this should be 15. <laughs> I was wondering, did I screw anything else up? I think that's right. 
I was checking because, you know, when you, if you sum these two numbers, you get 24, which is all the sum of all paths going through here. And that better be the same number here and also be, better be the same number there, right? Okay. Someone that should have caught that. Okay. Um, all right. So these are all the paths going through nine and, oh, sorry, going through this node. And um, if you look at all paths, that's going to be 15 plus nine. And that's going to be 24. Okay, so final answer is the probability of H2 equals two, given these made up uh, weights, is going to be nine over 24. Okay, any questions about that? <clears throat> okay, so l let me just quickly go over the slides, which is gonna be a more mathematical treatment of what I did on the board. Hopefully one of the ways will resonate with you. So define the forward messages for every node is going to be a sum over all of the uh, values at the previous time steps of the forward message at that previous time steps times the weight on the edge from uh, the previous value to the, the current value. Um, the backward is gonna be defined similarly for every node sum over all the values assigned to the, at the next time step, all outgoing edges, um, of the backward message at the next time step times the weight into that next time step. And then define S as simply just the product of F and B. Okay, so that's what I did on the board. And then finally, if you normalize the sum at each point in time, you can get the distribution over the hidden variable given all the evidence. And to summarize the algorithm, the forward-backward algorithm is actually a very old algorithm, um, developed actually first uh, for speech recognition um, a while back. I think it's you know, probably in the 60s or so. Um, so you sweep forward, you compute all the forward messages, and then you sweep backwards and compute all the backward messages. And then for every position, you compute SI for each I, and you normalize. So the output of this algorithm is not just the answer to one query, but all the smoothing queries you want. Because at every position, you have the distribution over the, um, the hidden variable hi. And the running time is n times uh, k squared, uh, because there's n time steps, and every time step, you have to compute this sum, so for k possible values here, you look at k possible values there, so that's a k squared, and it's n times k squared. Interestingly, if you ask, okay, what's the cost of computing a single query? It would also be n times k squared. So it's kind of cool that you compute all the queries in the same time that it takes to compute a single query. Okay, question. So the uh, question is, does this only work for hidden markup models, or is it more general? Um, there's certainly adaptations of this which work uh, very naturally for other types of networks. And one immediate generalization is if you have not just a chain structure, but you have a tree structure, then the idea of passing messages along that tree, um, it's called belief propagation, um, is, uh, just works pretty much out of the box. For Arbitrary Bayesian networks, this won't work because uh, you, once you have cycles, then you can't represent it as a lattice anymore. Any other questions? Okay, so summarize, the lattice representation uh, allows us to think of paths as assignments, which is a familiar idea if we're thinking about state-based models. Um, we can use the idea of dynamic programming to compute these sums efficiently, but we're doing this extra thing where we're computing all the sums um, for all the queries at once. And the forward-backward algorithm uh, allows you to share intermediate computation across the different queries. Yeah? The final output from this is like the mass for each SI? So the output of this algorithm is uh, basically the probability of HI given all the evidence for every I. Sequence EIs. Yeah. Not the hidden sequence, then 
take me from this product to this solution? Oh, so how would you actually use this? Do you sample from it? Um, depends on what you want to do with it. So the output of this, you can think about it as a distribution at each time step. So it's a n by k matrix of probabilities, right? From that, you can sample if you want. Um, you, can, you might be only interested in only a, a various points in time. Um, it's, yeah. Okay. So uh, let's move on to the second algorithm, which is called particle filtering. Um, so we're interested still in hidden Markov models, um, although particle filtering, again, is something actually much more general than that. Um, and we're going to only focus on query, uh, uh, filtering questions. So remember, filtering, we're at a particular time step. We're only interested in the probability of the hidden variable at that time step condition on the past. And why might um, we not be satisfied with um, hidden Markov or the forward-backward algorithm? So here's the motivating picture. So imagine um, you're doing uh, the car assignment, um, let's say, and you're tra so you're tracking cars, okay? So cars, let's say, live on a huge grid. Um, so at each position, hi, um, the value of hi is some point on this grid. But you don't know where it is. You want to track it, okay? So if this is like 100 by 100, you know, that's 10,000. Um, if this were a thing were continuous, it would be even you know, worse. Uh, so this, um, this k squared, where k is the number of values, could be like 10,000 squared, and that's a large number. Right, so um, even though hidden Markov model back with backward, uh, uh, forward backward is not exponential time, even the quadratic can be pretty expensive. And, and the further the motivation is, you know, you intuitively shouldn't have to um, pay that much, right? Because let's say your sensor tells you that, oh, the car is up here somewhere. And you know cars can't move all the way across here. So then, you know, but the algorithm is going to consider each of these possibilities, and most of the probabilities are going to have pretty much zero probability. So that's really wasteful to consider all of them. So can we somehow focus our energies on the region that um, have actually high probability? Yeah, question. So backwards, like for the later time steps, you can't have zero in, in one of those positions in our original table? Uh, the question is, can you go? Backwards. Like if you can't, like if you're continuing to move one way and you yeah. say like it's very unlikely that I'm going to go back to the starting position, do, uh -huh. do each of those variables have like the same domain, I'm saying? Oh, so each of these variables, uh, they don't have to be from the same um, domain. For this presentation, they're in the same domain just for simplicity. Um, but I think what you're asking is um, you know that maybe um, a car only moves, let's say, forward or something then there is some restriction on the domain. Um, it's not going to be that significant because you still don't know where the car is, so uh, it doesn't really cut out that many possibilities. Yeah, maybe by a factor of two or something, but that's not um, that significant. Yeah. Okay, so how do we go about making this a little bit more efficient? Um, so let's look at beam search. So our final algorithm is not going to be beam search. It's going to be particle filtering, but beam search is going to give us some inspiration. So remember, in beam search, we keep a set of k candidates of partial assignments, um, and the algorithm is as follows. You start with a, a single empty assignment, and then for every um, position, time step, um, I'm going to consider all the candidates, which are assignments to the pre first i minus 1 variables, I'm going to extend it. There's possible ways of extending it are setting hi to uh, v from any v in the domain of i. Um, so now I'm going to amass this uh, set of um, extended assignments. Um, now I have k times as many because each previous assignment got expanded by k. So I'm going to prune down. I'm just going to take all of them, sort them by weight, and take the, the top k. 
So visually, um, remember from last time, it looks like this. So here is uh, this object tracking um, where we have five variables. And you start with a beam search, which is um, assigning x1 to 0 um, or 1. And then um, you extend it. So you extend assignments, you prune down, you extend assignments, you prune down, you extend assignments and prune down, and, and so on. And at the end of the day, you get k candidates. Each candidate is a full assignment to all the variables, and it has a particular weight, which is its, its actual weight. Um, and at each intermediate time, it's a partial assignment to only the prefix of uh, i a random variable. And remember that beam search doesn't have any guarantees, it's just a heuristic, but it, uh, often it works well in practice. And the picture, picture you should have in your head is that you have the exponentially sized tree of all possible assignments, and beam search is a kind of this pruned uh, breadth first search along this tree, which only looks at promising directions and continues, um, so you don't have to keep track of all of them. Okay, so at the end, um, you can use beam search. You get a set of candidates, uh, which are uh, full assignments to all the random variables. Um, and you can compute uh, any quantities you want. Um, uh, so the problem with this is that it's slow. Um, for the same reasons as I described uh, you know, before, it requires considering every possible value of um, hi. So it's a little bit better than forward-backward, right? So for forward-backward, um, you have to have the domain size times the domain size. And now for beam search, um, it's the size of the beam times the domain size, you know, which is better. But, but still, I think we can do a little bit better than that. Um, and finally, there's this kind of more subtle point is that, um, as we'll see later, greedily taking the best k might not be the, the best thing to do because you want to maintain some diversity, right? Uh, just a kind of a, a quick visual. So suppose you, um, your beam consists of only cars over here. It's kind of a little bit redundant, but you might want a kind of a broader representation. OK, so the idea with um, particle filtering is to just tweak beam search a little bit. Um, and this is going to ex be expanded into three steps, which I'll talk about. Okay, so let me, um, does anyone need this on the board? Can I raise it? Okay, we're good. Anyway, you can look at the video if you uh, don't remember. All right, so there's three steps here, okay? And we're going to try to do this uh, pictorially over here. Um, so, so the idea behind particle f uh, filtering is I'm going to maintain a set of particles that kind of represent where I think the object uh, is. So imagine um, you know, the object starts over here somewhere. So you have a set of particles. And I'm going to iteratively go through these three steps. So propose um, a weight and um, uh, resample. So this is meant to be kind of a replacement of the extend prune uh, strategy for beam search. OK, so the first step is to propose. So at any point in time, particle filtering maintains a set of partial assignments, known as particles, that kind of tries to mimic a particular distribution. So um, to kind of jumping to the to second time step, we can think about this set of particles as representing the probability of H1 and H2 given the evidence you know, so far. Okay? Um, on the board, I'm only going to draw the, uh, the particle representing the value H2 um, because I, it's hard to draw trajectories. But you can think about um, uh, really particle filtering maintains this uh, lineage as well. OK, so the key idea of the proposal distribution is that, OK, we want to advance time now. So um, we're interested in H3, but we only have H2. So how do we figure out what H3 is? So we propose possible 
uh, values of H3 based on H2. So this is idea of proposal. We just simply draw H3 from this transition distribution. So this, remember, this distribution is, comes from the HMM. This is, you're given the HMM, so you can do this. Um, and this gives us a set of new particles which are now extended by one, and this represents the uh, distribution H1, H2, H3 given the same evidence. So pictorially, uh, you should think about propose as, um, so propose is kind of taking each of these particles and sampling according to the transition. So think about the particles as, um, you know, uh, just moving in some direction. It's almost like simulating where, you know, cars uh, are, are going. And this is done kind of stochastically and randomly. Okay, um, step two is to wait. So, so far the new locations really don't represent uh, reality, right? Because we also see E3. At time step three, we get a new observation that hasn't been incorporated somehow into this. We're just kind of s simulating what uh, might happen um, and so the idea here behind a re weighting is for each of those particles, we're going to assign a weight now, which is equal to the emission distribution over E3 given you know, H3. Again, this is the emission distribution, which is given by our HMM, so we can just evaluate uh, it whenever we feel like it. And the set of new particles, are, which are weighted, can be thought of representing this distribution, where now we have condition on um, E3 equals 1. Okay, so now each of these particles has some you know, weight. So on, on this picture, it kind of looks like this. Um, so maybe, let's say the uh, emission distribution is kind of, let's say, um, uh, let's say a Gaussian distribution around the observation. So suppose the observation tells you, well, it's over here somewhere, um, which means that these particles are going to uh, get higher weight, and these particles are going to get lower weight. Um, and if they're far away enough, then maybe they get like almost zero weight. So um, I, I'm going to kind of softly X these out. So think about these as, um, okay, maybe, maybe I'll do this. So I'll upweight these um, and kind of start downweighting them. So nothing really gets uh, zeroed out. But you can think about these as downweighting and these as upweighting, provided you have, let's say, some evidence um, E3 that tells you, you know, you're going in that direction. Okay. Okay. So the so final step is is really about a resource distribution question. Um, so now we have weighted particles. We need to somehow get back to unweighted particles. Okay. So which one to choose? Um, so imagine uh, you have this situation where you have particles which are kind of distributed. The weights of the particles are fairly uniform. Um, then you could imagine, let's take just the particles with the highest weight. Right? This is very similar to what beam search would do. We would just take all the particles with high weight and uh, just keep those and nothing else. Um, so this is not a crazy thing to do, but um, it, it might give you an impression that you're more confident than you actually are, right? Because imagine the, the weights are fairly uniform. So maybe this one is like you know, 0.5 and this one is like 0.48. Um, so you're kind of just breaking ties in a very biased way. Um, so the idea is that if you sample, instead of sample from this situation, you're gonna get something a lot more representative rather than just taking um, kind of the best. Okay, so how do you sample from this distribution? Um, so the general idea is if you have, if I, this is just kind of a useful module to have in your head. If I give you a distribution um, over n possible values, then I'm gonna draw, uh, let's say, k samples from this. So if I have a distribution over four possible locations with these probabilities or you know weights, then um, I might draw uh, four samples, and I might pick A1, uh, and then A2, and then I might pick A1 and A1. 
So some of these things are not going to be chosen uh, if they have sufficiently low probability. Okay? So going back to the, the particle filtering setting, um, we have these old particles, remembering, which are weighted. Um, and first, I'm going to normalize these weights to get a distribution. So add these numbers up and divide by that. And then I'm going to sample according to this distribution given what you saw on the previous slide. So I might draw, in this case, 0 on 1 once, and I might draw it again, and might not uh, even keep this particle, right? Um, and the idea here is that suppose a particle has really, really low weight. It has like 0 0.0001. Then um, I shouldn't kind of uh, keep um, it around and because it needs to occupy memory and I have to keep track of it. It's basically you know, gone, right? So this resampling kind of regenerates the pool by focusing the efforts uh, on the higher weight particles. And you might even resample a high weight particle multiple times um, um, and then not sample the low weight particles uh, zero times. Okay, so in this, uh, in this picture here, so resampling um, might, let's see, uh, how, do I, how do I draw this? So maybe now I have, um, maybe I sample this twice, maybe I sample this twice, and maybe these don't get sampled, maybe I sample this once, this once. Um, right, so, so the blue represent the particles after this one round of a particle filtering where I've kind of moved the particles over here a little bit and less away from there. So that's why it's kind of called particle tracking because you can think about the swarm of particles representing where the object might be and over time as, as I follow the transition dynamics and um, hit it with the observations, I can um, move this swarm over time. So that's the picture you should have in your head. Okay, so let's go through the formal algorithm. It's gonna be very similar to Bream search. So you start with empty assignment, and then you propose so where you take your partial assignments to the previous i minus one variables, and then I'm going to consider for each one of them just sampling once from this transition distribution and augmenting that assignment. So unlike beam search where the size of C prime was K times larger than C, the size of C prime is equal to the size of C in this case. Second, I reweight, so looking at the evidence and applying the evidence, a probability of evidence given the particle uh, HI um, gives me a weight for every particle. Um, and then I'm going to normalize this distribution, sample K elements independently from that distribution, and that it redistributes um, the, the particles to where I think they're more promising. Okay, so let's go through this um, quick demo. Um, so the same problem uh, as before, uh, I'm gonna set the number of particles to 100. So I start with all the particles um, assigning x1 you know, to zero, and there's 100 copies of them. Um, I extend, and notice that some of the particles go to zero and some of the particles go to one with uh, approximate probability proportional to whatever the transitions are. Um, and then going to redistribute, which changes the uh, balance a little bit. And I'm gonna extend, prune, um, extend. Um, by prune, I really mean uh, re-rate re and resample. Um, and notice that uh, the particles kind of get more, div this is more diverse than um, well, it's more diverse than beam search because I'm using k equals 100 rather than like three. But um, but you can see that um, some of these particles, might, like my like this one, have zero weight, so that when I resample, um, they just go away. Do you have a question? Yeah. Why don't we aggregate all of the ones into a single category and all of the zeros into a single category? Is it just to show the branching pattern, or is it actually relevant? Yeah. So that's a good question. So notice that. Um, all of these are, all of these zero for the purposes of um, X4 are 
just treated the same. So if you only care about the marginals, then you can collapse them, you're absolutely right. In this demo, it's, I'm maintaining the entire history so that, yeah, you can show the, see the branching. Okay, so this is that point. If you only care about the last uh, position and not about the possible trajectories, then you actually actually collapse all the particles with the same HI into uh, one. And then furthermore, if there's repeats, then you can just keep track of the, the count, right? And this is actually what you would do in your assignment. I'm giving you kind of the more general picture in case, because particle filtering is more general than just uh, looking at the last time step, but most of the time you're just interested in last time step. Okay, so just a quick kind of quick um, visual illustration of this. Um, let's define this factor graph where uh, you have um, transitions that are basically one or zero depending on whether H1, I and HI one, minus one are close to each other and OI is some sensor reading. Um, one thing I've been a little bit uh, sliding under the rug is sometimes I've talked about local conditional distribution, sometimes I've been talking about factors. Remember, from the point of view of inference, um, it really you know, doesn't matter. They're all just you know, factors, right? So in particular, if I give you a factor graph, which, right, remember, which is not necessarily a, a, a Bayesian network, I can nonetheless still define a distribution by simply just um, normalizing. Take all the weights uh, mult, uh, and normalize and divide by that. And these objects are actually called uh, Markov networks or Markov random fields, which is another object of study that we're not gonna talk about in this class, but um, this is actually a more you know, general way to think about the relationship between factor graphs and distributions. Um, we're only mostly focusing on um, uh, Bayesian networks in this class. But some examples will be more general than that. Okay, so you have uh, this distribution, and um, so you can play with this demo in the slides. If you click, then this yellow dot shows you uh, the observation at a particular point in time. And the noise, uh, the observation is related to the true position of some particle by based on the noise that you define here. So here I've defined box noise, which means that it's, it's gonna be a uniform distribution over a box of um, three, by th uh, three by three, or I guess a six by six uh, box. Um, and so if I increase the number of particles to, um, let's say 10,000, then what I'm gonna show you is a, a red blob um, that looks like it's trying to eat the um, uh, the yellow dot. Um, and this uh, red blob shows you uh, the set of particles where the intensity is the count of that number of particles in a particular cell. So this swarm kind of corresponds to on the board, it's the set of particles. Um, but since this is discretized, you can kind of see uh, the pile of particles piling up on each other. Um, and just to see how well this is doing, show true position, uh, you can see the blue dot is the actual object position, the yellow dot is the noisy observation, and it's trying to do its best to track where the blue is. It's not perfect, um, because this is kind of approximate algorithm, but it kind of gets most of the way there. Okay, any questions about particle filtering? So to summarize, you can do forward-backward if you can swallow computing a number of uh, domain values times number of domain values. If you have large domains, but you really think that none, most of them don't matter, then particle filtering is a, it's a good tool because it allows you to focus your energies on the relevant part of the space. Okay, so now let's revisit Gibbs sampling from a probabilistic inference point of view. So remember Gibbs sampling we talked about um, last week as a way to compute the maximum weight assignment in an arbitrary factor graph, where the main purpose is to get out of a local minimum. Um, so remember how Gibbs sampling works. You have a weight, which is defined for uh, complete assignments. 
So unlike particle filtering or beam search, we're starting with complete assignments and trying to modify the complete assignments rather than trying to extend partial assignments. Um, so you loop and uh, you compute, you pick up a variable xi, and then you consider all the possible, uh, um, possible values it could take on, and you choose uh, the value with probability proportional to its weight. Okay, let me show you this um, example that um, we saw last week. Uh, so, so same graph here. Um, so we start with this complete assignment, um, and then we're gonna examine x1. x1 can take on two possible values. For each of these values, I'm going to compute its weight. And remember in Gibbs sampling, I only need to consider the Markov blanket of that variable. Uh, the factors here are O1 and T1 because that's the only thing that kind of changes. Everything else is a constant. Um, and then I'll s normalize and sample from that. Okay, so then um, I go on to the next variable and so on. So I sweep across all the variables and um, eventually the weight hopefully goes up, but not always up because sometimes I might sample a value that has lower probability. Okay, and at the same time, I can do various things like um, computing the, the marginal distribution over a, a particular variable, so, or of two variables. So I can um, basically count the number of times I see particular patterns, and I can normalize that to get a distribution over that particular pattern. Okay. So now let's try to interpret Gibbs sampling from a probabilistic uh, point of view. So instead of just thinking about a, a weight as just a function, we can actually think about the probability distribution induced by that factor graph by, again, summing all the weights over all possible assignments, normalizing, and there you have a distribution. Um, so the way to think about Gibbs sampling is now more succinctly and more actually traditionally written as uh, the following, which is you loop through all the variables, and for every variable, you're going to look at the probability of that variable taking on a particular value condition on everything else. So now you can give like, write down this probability, which is you know, a nice way to think about what Gibbs sampling is actually you know, doing. Um, and the, the guarantee with Gibbs sampling um, under you know, some conditions, which I won't get into, is that as you run this for long enough, you, uh, the sample that you get is actually a true sample from this distribution, as if you had sampled from this distribution. And if you did that multiple times, now you can actually compute any sort of marginal uh, distribution you, know, you like. So now, while there's, uh, that guarantee sounds really nice, there are situations where Gibbs sampling could take exponential time to get there, so caveats. Okay, so let's look at a possible application of Gibbs sampling, image denoising. So suppose you have some sort of noisy image and you want to clean it up. So how can this be um, helpful? Um, so we can model this image denoising problem as um, this factor graph where um, you have a grid of uh, pixel values. Um, and uh, they're connected um, in this kind of uh, grid-like way. So every value at xi is where i is a location, it, um, two numbers, is going to be either uh, zero or one. Um, and we're gonna assume that some subset of the pixels are observed. Um, and in case uh, we observe it, then we're actually just going to have a, a factor that is actually a constraint that says that value xi has to be whatever we observed. And uh, these, we have these um, transition potentials that say neighboring pixels are more likely to be the same than different. So it assigns value two to pixels which are the same and one to pixels which are different. Okay, so is the model clear? So now let's try to do Gibbs sampling in this in this model. Just to give you a uh, concrete idea of what this looks like. Um, so I'm gonna look at 
I'm not going to draw the entire um, the grid, but I'm going to center around a particular node that we're interested in um, sampling. So there's more stuff over here. Okay, so, um, and remember in GIP sampling, um, at any point in time, all the variables have some sort of preliminary uh, assignment. So this might be one, um, uh, one, one, and zero, and this might be one, okay? Um, so now I sweep through and I'm gonna pick up this variable and I'm gonna say, hmm, shall I try to change its value? First of all, you ignore the old value because it doesn't uh, factor into the algorithm. And now you're going to consider, um, uh, let's say, let's, this is xi, so xi, there's two possible um, uh, values here, so zero and one, right? So, um, and I'm gonna look at the weight. So if it's zero, then I'm gonna evaluate each of these uh, factors based on that. So remember, the transition potential is, um, um, well, I'm not gonna write it down, but if, let's consider zero here. So these are different, that means I'm gonna get a one. Um, these are different, that's gonna be a one. These are different, that's gonna be a one. Um, these are the same, and I'm gonna get a two, okay? Now I try one. Um, these are the same, these are the same, these are the same, and uh, these two are different. Um, so for every assignment, I have this weight. So this is two, this is eight. Um, and then I uh, normalize. So this is going to be 0.8, and this is going to be 0.2. And I draw um, uh, flip a coin with heads uh, 0.8. And whatever I get, I put down. So I might have, with point A probability, I put one back, and so on. Okay, and here's another example, which I'm not gonna go through. Okay, so Gibbs sampling is gonna do that. So now let's look at this uh, um, concrete, oops. Okay, so, hold on. Okay, so what you're looking at here is this grid of pixels. Um, White means that the pixel is unobserved. Black or red means that it's observed to be whatever color uh, you see on the screen. And uh, so this is kind of somewhat of a noisy image, and the goal is to fill in the white pixel so the picture makes sense. And visually, you guys can probably look at this and see the hidden uh, text. No? Okay, <laughs> okay, so your uh, denoising system is pretty good. Um, okay, so I'm gonna run Gibbs sampling, so you click, and what you're seeing here, each iteration, I'm gonna go through every pixel and apply exactly the algorithm I, whatever I did on the board, okay? So you can see that um, these are just samples from uh, the set of unobserved random variables. Okay, so to turn this into something more, um, useful, you can, instead of looking at the particular sample, you look at um, the marginal, which is for every location, what is the average pixel value that I've seen so far? Um, and if you do that, then you can see a little bit clearer picture of um, 221. And it's not gonna be perfect because the model that we have is fairly simplistic. All it says is similar pixels, uh, neighboring pixels are, are tend to have the same um, uh, color and has no notion of you know, letters or something. Okay, but you can see kind of a simple example of uh, you know, GIP sampling at work. Um, there's a bunch of parameters you can play with. Um, you can, here's a, another picture of a cat that you can um, try to, um, you can play around with the coherence, which is how sticky the, the uh, transition constraints are, you could try to use ICM, which won't work um, at all, and so on. Okay, any questions? I think we might actually end early today. Okay, so 
Um, just to kind of sum up, we've last week, Mondays, we defined new models. So we defined a Bayesian network or a factor graph. And today, we're focusing on the question of how do we do probabilistic inference? And for some set of models, I've shown you how to do this. Um, there's a number of algorithms here. Um, and I, a forward, backward, which uh, work for HMMs and are exact. Particle filtering, which works for HMMs, although they can be generalized, which is approximate. And Gibbs sampling, which works for general factor graphs, which is also approximate. Each of these algorithms, we've seen kind of these ideas uh, in previous incarnations. So forward, backward is very similar to variable elimination. Um, because it all, variable animation also uh, computes things exactly. Um, particle filtering is like beam search. Um, it computes things approximately. And Gibbs sampling is like um, iterative conditional modes or Gibbs sampling, um, which uh, we saw from last week. OK, so uh, next Monday, we're going to look at how we do learning. So up until now, the Bayesian network, all the probabilities are fixed. And now we're going to actually start to do learning. Um, I should say that maybe this learning sounds a bit scary because there's already a lot of machinery behind uh, inference and factors and all this stuff. But you'll be pleasantly surprised that learning is actually much simpler than inference. So stay tuned. <laughs>